And welcome back! Today we're looking again at Faust, and we're talking about the scene Walpurgis Night and Walpurgis Night's Dream. And we're trying to figure out what is going on! Why, Goethe? Why? So, right in the middle of this intense and deep story about Gretchen's suffering and destruction, we just hop over to the other side of the world where Faust is having a crazy witch party. This scene is seriously weird. In fact, for the most part, it really doesn't seem to fit the rest of the action of the story of Faust, especially not the horrible second half, Walpurgis Night's Dream. Mephistopheles takes Faust on a wild witch party to explore the pleasures of Walpurgis Night on top of Mount Brocken in the Hearts Mountains. And here he is going to experience all the ghouls and goblins and witches and horrors, and all of them are going to get together and have a wild, very intense very crazy party, which, according to Goethe's original intent, was supposed to end with them standing in front of Satan and jumping around and having wildness. Goethe actually didn't ever finish his original intention for this scene. He intended it for it to be, it to be twice as long. Can you imagine? And so the Walpurgis Night's Dream section was really only going to be the middle of the scene, and it was going to continue on for another whole section. The scene starts with Faust and Mephistopheles walking up the mountain, and Faust is enjoying the walk, although Mephistopheles says a broomstick would be faster. And then they run into a Will of the Wisp, and then they have this Will of the Wisp following party. Now, Will of the Wisps are mythological creatures or legendary creatures that are supposed to misguide you and lead you astray. They're these little lights in the woods that you follow and you wind up uh, going the wrong direction and getting very lost. But in this case, the Will of the Wisp is leading them to the party, and all three of them sing this song together as they dance up the mountain. And they begin to see all of these figures who come from different kinds of mythology, particularly the Germanic kind of legend and folklore. We're going to save most of the real Greek and Roman myths for part two of Faust. And as they climb the mountain, they're joined by all these witches and warlocks who are soaring by, some of them on foot, some in the air, and it gets more and more tempestuous and more and more crazy. And sometimes it almost seems as if Faust is going to be pulled away from Mephistopheles and lost in this mass of chaos. They play this game of, like, Marco Polo for a moment when the middle of this crowd gets all crazy and wild, and Mephistopheles starts shouting, Where are you? And Faust over, is over here, and he says, Over here! And Mephistopheles says, So far adrift already, I must assert my birthright. Steady! Make room! It's Nick! Squire Nick! Sweet mob, give ground! Here, doctor, take my hand, and in one bound let us escape the crush and flee. This is too wild for even the likes of me. The party's gotten too crazy even for Mephistopheles! And so they pull aside a bit and continue to climb up the mountain. Then all of a sudden they wander into these figures who appear to be sort of different people that Goethe knows in life, that he's just stuck into this part of the story. And it becomes this blend of weird allegory where Goethe is commenting upon different political groups or different uh, critics that he's had in the past. And although this may have been interesting to him at the moment, it really isn't for us. Because a lot of these people are so forgotten and so unimportant, ultimately, that we really have no point of reference for them. Even if you were to do a deep historical study of Goethe's life and figure out who all these little people he's referencing are, it would just be passing interest and be like, oh, okay, so that's that guy. Great. Mm. So it's this weird blend of crazy, sensual partying and political commentary. All that's going to get much worse in the Walpurgis Night's Dream scene. We mentioned several people from folklore, like Old Babo. Uh, they mentioned Lilith, who is um, uh, a Jewish folklore figure. All these old witch figures. And near the top of the mountain, Faust and Mephistopheles join in this dance with some witches. There's an old witch who appears to be the same witch from the witch's kitchen scene we saw much earlier, and Faust is dancing with a pretty young witch. It's very wild and very creepy, and through all of this, we're probably experiencing a lot of frustration, because why has Faust just let himself forget Gretchen? How could he just leave her and go out and have this wild fun time with this pretty young witch? It's not okay. And this whole scene just seems so bizarre and so weird and so nonsensical. Why is this included here? When all of a sudden, something important does happen. 
there are lots of ways to analyze this scene and interpret this scene, but from my perspective and for this study, I'm really going to look at two key points. Number one, I'd like to compare how Mephistopheles attempts to drag Faust into pleasure works much better here than it does in the Auerbach's Tavern scene. Do you remember way back in the Auerbach's Tavern scene how when Mephistopheles dragged Faust to this tavern and he tried to show him a good time by messing with these drunk people, that was his first attempt at pulling Faust into the world of pleasure. And it really, really failed. Faust was not in the least interested. Now, here we are, and Mephistopheles is dragging him into this world of crazy, weird magic and pleasure, and Faust is really getting into it, until the very end. Faust has changed over all this time, and we have to stop and question why. There are a lot of possibilities. Perhaps the influence of Mephistopheles is rubbing off on him? Perhaps it's this magical quality of all of this, and the fact that here he is among the witches and fairies that makes it so much more entertaining and enjoyable. Perhaps he's simply had a taste of pleasure with Gretchen and now wants to go on to experience more outlandish things. We also could compare this scene to the witch's kitchen scene way back. There's obviously the connection between the old witch, but in the witch's kitchen scene, Faust was very turned off by all the weird magic-y things. And he said, oh, all this hocus pocus, it's kind of creepy and gross. He liked the elevated, more elegant magic. And the, the magic of the witch's kitchen scene just didn't appeal to him. Well, he's really steeped in that kind of magic here in Walpurgis Night, and yet he seems to be fully embracing it. So he has changed. Does this mean that Mephistopheles is a lot closer to winning the bet? Perhaps, but then something happens. The second thing that's really important in this scene for our overall study of the Faust story is this moment at the end of the Walpurgis Night scene when Faust sees the vision of Gretchen. So Faust is dancing with the pretty young witch and all of a sudden he stops. And he gives two reasons for stopping. The first one is that a mouse pops out of her mouth, which is kind of a turn off. But the second one is even more important. That is because he sees a wraith or a ghostly figure who looks just like Gretchen. Look, Mephisto, yonder, lone and apart, the maiden pale and sweet, but haltingly she seems to wander as if advancing with unparted feet. There would appear to me, I swear, a likeness to dear Gretchen there. He sees this vision of this ghostly figure who looks like Gretchen, but she doesn't look very good. She's moving with unparted feet as if she's been chained up. And Mephistopheles says, no, 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 don't look at that. That's a wraith, that's a, that's a creature much like Medusa who will turn you to stone if you keep looking. Stop looking. Does Faust stop? No, not so. A dead girl's eyes I see, that no dear hand closed for her as she died. This is the breast that Gretchen proffered me. This the enchanting body I enjoyed. He sees her and she looks dead, but it's definitely a vision of Gretchen. Mephistopheles continues to try to stop him from looking and says, no, 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 it's just a trick. Anyone who looks at it will see his most beloved person, so don't look. What torment, yet how sweetly relished, that gaze I cannot seek escape. How strangely is the graceful neck embellished by a red strand from throat to nape, a scarlet knife edge, as it were. So the more Faust stares, the more he sees. He sees that this ghost seems to have a red line around her neck, as if her head has been chopped off. And Mephistopheles once again explains this away, saying, Quite so, I too see it on her. You're apt to find her walking head in hand. Perseus cut off her head, you understand. You're always off on some fancy. So again, he comes back and ties it into the Medusa myth, because in the Medusa myth, Perseus cut off Medusa's head. And so this wraith that you're seeing, it's not Gretchen. It's not Gretchen who's been executed. No, 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 this is Medusa. Don't look at it. What evidence do we have that this really is Medusa? And what evidence do we have that it's actually a vision of Gretchen? Well, we never really get an explanation, but it sure seems like Mephistopheles is not telling the truth. After all, he says it's Medusa, and if you look at it, you'll turn to stone. And does Faust keep looking? Yes. Does he turn to stone? No. That's pretty good evidence that Mephistopheles is not telling the truth. Second of all, this is Walpurgis Night, and all the figures here are mythological legendary, yes, but none of them are from classical mythology. No, they're more from Germanic mythology. And so Medusa being here is kind of out of place. And in fact, we're going to see that the vision that Faust sees of Gretchen here is definitely foreshadowing. 
finally Mephistopheles says, oh look, a play, let's go see the play. Come on, Faust, come on, let's go see the play. And he drags Faust away from the vision. And then we watch the play, which is the Walpurgis Night's dream scene. But it is interesting that Mephistopheles put so much effort into getting Faust away from this vision. Although Mephistopheles says it's for Faust's own safety, it rather seems that Mephistopheles doesn't want Faust to be snapped out of the party. He doesn't want Faust to return to his ideas of Gretchen, to his memories of Gretchen. This is sort of Faust's conscience finally striking him, and he loses the pleasure of the moment in his memory of what he's done to Gretchen and what is probably happening to her right now. And Mephistopheles doesn't want to lose that. And so then we go on to the Walpurgis Night's Dream, or the Golden Wedding of Oberon and Titania. And it's so bad and so frustrating. And if you read criticism on this scene, the critics will say, why is this so bad and so frustrating? The most reasonable explanation for this scene is that it is Goethe pointing out that no one is really, that the, the failures of poetry perhaps, because it's such bad poetry, is these really lame quatrains over and over again that are not really in any way connected, that seem to be commenting on every political idea and critic and uh, figure that Goethe knew, plus a lot of other sort of ideas, and it's just not good stuff. But perhaps it's the whole idea of how um, all of our voices fail to truly express who we are. I don't know, it's just terrible. But it's obviously an allusion to Midsummer Night's Dream, which is a really fantastic play by Shakespeare. Really wonderful. And uh, Oberon and Titania are the king and queen of the fairies, and it appears to be that all these characters are supposed to be coming before them and presenting their poem to Oberon and Titania to celebrate their, their marriage. Um, but in doing so, it sure seems like all we do is sort of undermine the wonderful fairy tale that this is based upon. We have references to Puck, to Oberon, to Titania, also to Ariel, who's another fairy figure from Shakespeare, not Midsummer Night's Dream, actually, Tempest. But all of these figures um, really fall short of the source material. I mean, Midsummer Night's Dream is a fantastic play and so much fun but this is not a good representation of it. So we sludge through this scene and shake our heads and say, okay, whew, thank goodness that's over. Let's go back to the real story. What's going to happen with Gretchen? What's going to happen when Faust realizes what's going on with Gretchen? And all of that will be explored in our next episode when we come to the conclusion of part one. The Disney song for this particular section is Arabian Nights. Oh, we've come to a land, to a faraway place, where the ghouls and the warlocks roam. Where the witches get paid for the potions they've made. It's infernal, but hey, it's home. You hear shrieks from the east, and the sun's nearly set, and you know that you're in for a fright. Come on up, stop on by, hop a broomstick, and fly to another called Walpurgis Night. It's Walpurgis Night, not those sweet German days with witches you're caught through the magic you've sought dancing the night away thanks for watching this episode on the craziest most bizarre scene in the book you can click up here for the previous episode or click down here for the next episode and click here to subscribe I'll see you next time as we finally return to our story and really get the big rousing conclusion which is pretty awesome I'll see you then